Welcome to the first Fearless Conversations panel discussion, a joint venture between the advertiser and Flinders University. It is about being brave in our thinking about how we drive South Australia forward and challenge ourselves to position this great state for future success. There will be 13 Fearless discussion panels over the next 13 weeks, involving a range of topics from defence and high-tech innovation, tourism, infrastructure, education and health, among others. For each discussion, we've assembled a group of high profile, thought provoking leaders in their field to pose a series of questions in order to explore their views on the opportunities and challenges relating to each topic. Today, we explore the opportunity, power and influence of sport. Feel free to join the conversation through Twitter using hashtag Fearless Conversations or in the comments section on advertiser.com.au. Thank you for joining Fearless Conversations. My name is Andrew Capel, Senior Sports Writer with The Advertiser, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion and encouraging our guests to be brave. Before I introduce today's panellists, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting in the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and First Nations people. Today, we are joined by four experts in sport. On the end, Matthew Richardson, Chief Executive of the Port Adelaide Football Club. Welcome, Matthew. Um, Andrew Daniels, next to Matthew, Chief Executive of the Adelaide Oval Stadium Management Authority. Bronwyn Cly. Chief Executive of Netball SA and former General Manager of the Adelaide Strikers T20 men's and women's teams, and Sam Elliott next to me, multiple award-winning researcher and senior lecturer at Flinders University. Welcome team, thanks for being on board. So we're gonna start, we're gonna explore the world of sport in the COVID pandemic era. What are the biggest challenges facing sport in South Australia as we emerge from the pandemic and how do we overcome these? Bronwyn, you want to start? Yeah, well, I think the main challenge that sport's going to face is probably financial. You know, I think that sport's been very hard hit during the, the pandemic. Um, it's cost a lot of money to run sport over the last last couple of years. You know, there's talk of the AFL spending 500 to $600 million over the past couple of years to keep the competition playing. Um, you know, we know that Tennis Australia is blowing through a lot of reserves trying to get the Australian Open played last year and uh, it costs a lot of money to fly players around and keep them in bubbles. So I think financially, this is gonna take a long time for sport to recover. Mm -hmm. Andrew? I, I think that's quite right, Bronwyn. And I think what we're seeing is that a lot of, a lot of sporting clubs, a lot of stadium business, uh, sporting business organisations, the cash has been burnt over the last 18 months. So the reserves that were built up for a rainy day, well, it certainly poured over the last year and a half. And, uh, and so they're now gone. So, looking ahead the, the challenges of of finance we know at the at the adelaide oval part of our big role is to is to generate provide a, a basis on which sports can generate income to survive we also of course need to pay for the adelaide oval which is an incredibly expensive asset in its own right so um that is a huge challenge uh the next challenge that from a venue <laughs> viewpoint is going to be with the expectations of clubs of uh, uh, whether it be football, cricket, or, or anyone else, and patrons, they've changed over the last 18 months, and we need to respond to that change. Ready? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> agree with the points. I, I think people's behaviours and the impact that it has um, across all levels, whether it be participation or attending sport, or it's people have got used to staying at home and watching it on television. Um, I think that's um, that'll be a challenge mm -hmm. uh, for sport, but. But also, I think um, you know, and feeding into you know the fearless theme is, it also presents great opportunity for sports. And you can either you can take a glass half empty or a glass half full approach. And for those sports and and teams and clubs that see the opportunities that can come from it to do things differently, um, there, there's also great opportunity coming out of coming out of this. And that's mm -hmm. certainly how our footy club um, is approaching it. Sam? Yeah, I've got a slightly different take. I mean, fundamentally, I come to this conversation as a researcher. And what the research tells us is that the pandemic, especially in South Australia, has, has impacted community and youth sport in ways that have been unprecedented. Um, and so for me, one of the biggest challenges that I see is that while many families, many communities have returned to sport, 
Um, there's been a lot of families, a lot of communities that have not. And I think as an industry, we have an obligation to ask questions about who has not returned, maybe why, and what we can do across all sectors of our industry, what we can actually do to assist. I think that's like a really important immediate short-term challenge. Um, and, and longer term, I think given the uncertainty of um, the, the world that we live in right now, I think one of the big challenges for any sector of industry at the local level, at the grassroots, right through to the elite level, is how do we create a more knowledgeable, a skilled and agile sector so we can actually navigate change. And I think that's one of the, for, for me as a researcher, it's gonna be one of the key challenges to make sure that knowledge that is generated through our research is accessible, is usable, and has immediate impact for all our stakeholders. So there's probably a short and long-term, I think, challenge um, for all of us in sport. And we all love sport, that's why we're here today. But how important will sport be in helping communities recover from COVID? Yeah, well, sport plays a massive role, we know, in communities anyway. And I think back to the time just before COVID when we had the bushfires in Kangaroo Island mm -hmm. and we were all over there trying to help those communities recover and fundraise and build, rebuild their facilities to get people back on courts and fields. So I think when you return to sport, in many ways, you return to normality and that's what people are seeking. That's a good point, Bromwood. And in fact, I think back, the last, the biggest event, probably other than the, the Port Adelaide showdown, uh, that we've had in the last two years was the bushfire showdown mm. just before COVID hit and we had a packed Adelaide Oval seeing a showdown of um, T20 cricket which was an amazing mm. sort of conglomeration of different sports different people and it worked so well and we raised over a million dollars and that was sport bringing community together and uh, I think it was a classic example of of the good that really can be done. That was a fantastic day wasn't it? it was a massive an crowd day. there too. Yeah. Great publicity. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Matthew? Yeah, I think sport at every level connects communities and connects people. Um, at the elite level, um, it, 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 is, it, it gives people something to look forward to, something to be part of and feel part of. And then you look at the community level out in the regional areas that have, as you said, been impacted by bushfires or those types of things that it's so important to the fabric of regional communities to bring people together. And especially through these times where we're, a lot of people have been isolated or had to stay at home or their work's been impacted. Um, sport is a, is a great thing that actually brings people together together at its very core. Mm -hmm. Sam? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the, the economic benefit of community sport participation, so just at one tier of, of, of engagement is around a $6.3 billion you know, economic benefit nationally. So you cannot underestimate um, you know, at the grassroots, ground up approach of re-engaging people, families in sport. Um, but some research that I've actually been doing has actually shown that when you compare before and during uh, the pandemic in terms of sport participation and, and the people that are involved in community sport, um, there's been a one in three uh, or, or one out of every three people, um, young persons included, uh, have reported a decline in mental health and wellbeing. And so that's significant. And it probably shows the importance of social connectedness. It probably shows the importance of, of community cohesion. Um, and they're the kind of things that I think underwrite the, not just the economic, but the social importance of what you um, in the industry do. I think it's super important. Yeah. And sports played a massive role in getting us through COVID. It's been tough on sports people mm. too, hasn't it? Like there's been seasons delayed, seasons shortened, mm. um, weeks and months during season when players are playing that's been put on hold. Uh, Matty, you've got a, um, you know, a, a major AFL final at Adelaide Oval on Friday night, crowd of 15,000. So it's, it's been in, in also impacted in many ways. Yeah, it has. And uh, I think the first thing to say is, um, every part of the community has and and at much more severe levels than you know elite sport elite sports um is fortunate in a way but um you know all all, all of our players and across the afl and the afl itself in order to uh and netball to keep a lot the elite sport going in order to, and the role it plays in the community has been significant but all of those people have made really significant sacrifices whether it be through isolation or you know living away from family for long periods of time we've got afl teams that are about to go on the road for four or five weeks to perth potentially we've got sydney and gws who have been away from family now for the best part of three months so it's um it's real and you know to sam's point um well-being is a is absolutely a major focus and and will be a major focus coming out of this as well but it's been so good for the public to still have sport in this period because yeah. it could easily have been shut down. Can I just say that there's a week in July there where at Netball SA we 
with, with COVID border restrictions um, coming into play. There was a week there where we were a COVID hub, so the entire Correct. SSN came to Adelaide um, at the start of that week and we hosted two games. They were all, all teams were coming here. By the, so by the middle of the week, we were in lockdown. And by the end of the week, our stadium was a COVID testing station. So, you know, that is pivot, pivot, pivot. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, that's how, how much people have been affected um, by the pandemic and how much our organisations have had to adapt. That timing wasn't great for netball, was that it? That timing was terrible for netball. <laughs> we were finally a hub and then we, we lost it. But, mm. um, you know, that, that, that's the way we're rolling at the moment. Mm. Let's talk about racism. We don't want to talk about it, it's disappointing, but the Taylor Walker incident and subsequent Eddie Betts response felt like a line in the sand moment. Was that a line in the sand moment? Have, have we, what have we learned from the situation? What do we need to do to get better in this space? Yeah, I think it, it, it was a bit of a line in the sand moment. It was a different moment. And I think what was different about it was that um, instead of moving to protect you know the football star or the football icon there was movement to protect the person that reported the incident and i think that that was different and i think that it's incumbent on us um to make sure that people know that it's not acceptable to say things and that we empower our people to actually be able to, to say that and knowing that sports will act on will act on those incidents i think that's that's quite right i was very pleased to see the uh, the the number of people that came out in support of uh, the Crows official that reported yeah. it. Yeah. We pushed very, very hard at the Adelaide Oval, obviously, to be a fully inclusive uh, stadium. And 99.999% of people do the right thing. But we also rely on the crowd to self-report as well, to report well, we've got security and we've got ushers and we've got CCTV and police. Uh, but there's nothing like people who are in amongst the crowd being able to text confidentially, which is the best way, so nobody knows they've done it, to us and, and report incidents so that we can respond. Um, and we have seen an uptick in that, which is which is really good. And uh, we get some ridiculous people complaining, particularly, you know, the umpire is very bad, can you do something about that? No, well, we can't respond to that. But, but it is so important that we get a chance to react uh, and react quickly. It then does, it disappoints me when I think that we haven't done that right. Um, because we as a venue, big venue, lots of people working there from all different um, walks of life. So we need to keep the pressure on our own staff to make sure that we are responding appropriately and quickly to any incidents. They are rare, but when they happen, they can be really devastating. So they are quite rare? You're not getting too many incidents? No, they, they are quite rare, quite rare But and, and you know about them when they happen. Um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the terrible you know, banana incident a few years ago, that was just horrifying but they the ripple effects go for for years from an event like that and it's so important that we are presenting the Adelaide Oval as a totally inclusive a fun place to come yes sport is is tense and people get so engrossed in the game um, and we respect that and we want them to cheer and and criticize the umpire and all sorts of things but within appropriate limits uh, we are on a journey with this. There, there is still more education needed and some people are still back in the 1960s in their approach. Do you think we are getting better? Oh, definitely. And the numbers show that. that. Yeah. In the nearly 10 years that, that I've run the Adelaide Oval, I have seen that constantly improve, but we've still got more to go and we need to keep that pressure on. Matthew, Paul yeah, Allo's perspective. I think there are probably three things that stood out for me. One is it's just a stark reminder that we can all be better. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, uh, you know, if there's anything that is good that comes from it, it drives conversation, whether it be conversation at home with our kids or our, uh, with our families or in the workplace. And, and, the, and the other thing for me was um, there is no but in this conversation. And yeah. um, I think that was one of the things that really stood out for me. There were, um, there were too many buts um, and there mm. just can't be in this space. Yeah. Sam, your take on it? Yeah, I, I, I agree fundamentally with the, the sentiments um, that have been shared already. But I, I guess my additional comment is that um, from an academic standpoint, when we're talking about racism in the context of sport, um, I've just published a, a, a paper on this. One of our key arguments is that right now in Australian society, um, it'd be fair to say that we, lived in, we, we live in what we might call a, a post-racial context. And so if you sort of take a history of this, it's like, well, in the 80s and the 90s, multiculturalism was a really key government priority. And so you've seen the sort of the artifacts of that and the consequences of that. But you fast forward to 2021, um, characteristics of a post-racial context might be that when something happens, 
there are still proponents of our society, you can see it in social media feeds, where people reduce these incidences to a slip of the tongue or um, I made a gaffe or I made a blue. And so you've got that sort of one end of the, the scale, but at the other, can, I guess at the other end, um, there are other people that would um, call out that type of behavior and be labeled a, a social justice warrior or a, um, you know, someone that's got a political correctness agenda. And so it's, it's, it, that's the tension that we're still working through. When you say we still would have some conversations, it's about how we navigate as a society um, this, this post-racial sort of context, because that, that bandwidth is something that we need to try and close the gap on. And I think that's where, um, you know, the need is like, the question might be, well, where do we go from here? Okay, and I think one of the things that we need to look at is how we can establish, um, how would you call this, like maybe like an anti-racism alliance. I know at Flinders we take, we take this issue seriously. We're fully committed to a reconciliation uh, action plan, but at the same time, that's, that's specific to Flinders. And I'd love to see in sport, a more integrated approach where we are literally on the same page, saying the same chorus yeah. and our actions speak louder than our words. I think yeah. that's what we need to see. And it, it's across all domains. It's in schools, yeah. it's in the elite level of sport, it's at the state level organizations, yeah. it's in universities. I think that's a step in the right direction. But mm -hmm. if we don't do that, mm -hmm. then this post-racial context will continue mm -hmm. to exist where if it's a, a you know a high profile commentator in the AFL making a gaff, uh, we saw that a few years ago um, to to recently with um, mm. you know with what's happened in the media. So I, I think that's um, my sense on on where we go from here. Why does it feel like racism is more prominent with male sports rather than female? Is that perhaps because the men get more publicity? Ron, what's your yeah, I don't know if it's more, I don't know if that's fair that I think there it's not not fair to say it's more prominent in men's sport. Um, I think some women can be racist and some men can be racist. You know, I think it's incumbent on all of us to just empower empower each other, as Sam said, to find a way to call it out when you see it. You know, it's also not just about elite sport. My my kids have now started going to community footy um, on weekends, and I'm I'm not I'm here to pick on on footy, but I know some of the things that are said at grassroots footy on a Saturday mm. are pretty bad. Mm. So it really shows me that we do you know we do have a long way to come. I think we're able to call it out and, and deal with it a little better. Is that from sport. the players playing or from the spectators, parents watching? From parents watching, okay. and from spectators. I think it's still a little rough out there. So I think you know to Sam's point, how can sport get one narrative? I don't know if there's a reason why we couldn't do that, Sam. Mm. Is to find one narrative, be on one page, find one narrative, and make it a cause. Mm. I think that would be an excellent starting point. Matthew, your thoughts on making it a one narrative? Yeah, absolutely. It has to be if we're, if we're serious about it, which we are. Then mm. um, yeah, there can be no difference. Yes. I think it has to be led from the elite level. So because that the kids look up to the elite, that's where they want to get to. Mm. Uh, and so we need, to, at, at an elite level, we need to set that perfect example. And I think that's a very interesting to make sure the narrative is consistent across mm -hmm. the top so that the kids know that they can call their parents yeah. out. Yep. That's inappropriate. Yep. Uh, it's, it's got to be top down as well as bottom up. And that appears to have happened in the Taylor Walker yeah. situation, yeah, it does. doesn't it? Mm. With the trainer calling yeah. out texts. Mm. Mm. So in the end, there might be some positive results from that. Um, women's sport has come a long way in the past few years in South Australia, particularly due to the emergence of the AFLW. Crows have had a team in. Port Adelaide will have a team in now for the 2022-23 season. A great result. Australia's female athletes also were the dominant performers at the Tokyo Olympics. What have we learned? How much better is women's sport as far as not only the standard, but also getting the publicity that it deserves? And what needs to happen next? Okay, well, I'm going to go out on a limb here yep. and say, you know, anyone would, th you know, AFL have been playing women's sport now for five years. Anybody would think that the AFL or traditional men's sports, cricket, etc., have invented women's sport. You know, I think that ignores the fact that women have been, you know, 54% of women participate in sport. Teams like the Opals, the Diamonds, the Matildas, the Hockey Roos have been successful on the world stage for many, many years. You know, as you rightly pointed out, Andrew, you know, women had double the, double the propensity to win gold medals at the last Olympic Games. Soccer had their first international women's competition, I think it was something like 48 years ago. So I kind of get a bit annoyed when it says, OK, well, now women's, we're finally making some progress because AFL have come along. They've been doing it for five years, you know, and I'd like to see women's sport credited with, you know, with the efforts that it's already put in and try and, 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 you know, and reap the rewards of, of many years of hard work from many sports. Sam? 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really interesting point. I guess um, I come to this conversation again as a researcher, and I think my my sense is that I'm, I'm a little uneasy. I'm a little uneasy with these these narratives that I find troubling about progress. And we, you know, you, you've, you've cited some examples there at the elite level, and they should be celebrated. We should nurture them. We should try and cultivate them to energize and, and inspire a, a generation to come. Absolutely, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, but as a researcher, the evidence would also show that um, these, these narratives of, of progress are actually kind of juxtaposed against the reality of community level sport. And so when young children, when young girls enter sport, the participatory experience is far from the narratives of opportunity and access, you know, um, limited access to quality coaching, change rooms, resources, education. Um, this is not theoretical. These are things that have actually been published and, and researched in a range of sporting contexts. And I think we need to try and again, try and redress the, the gap between the, the I guess, the um, the, the, the inspiration that, that sport at the elite level and success at the elite level inspires um, with the reality of the challenges or let's call them the barriers that a lot of young people still face. I think that's absolutely key. Until we do that, these gold medals and the success at the Tokyo Olympics will get young people looking at sport. They'll, like, they'll, they'll, they'll consider their involvement, but their first initiation into sport, we need to actually get that right. And if we do that, then our retention strategies and our ability to grow our game is gonna be, um, you know, there's no boundaries to that. Interestingly, the Ausplay data will show that before the pandemic, so let's sort of ignore that, since 2017, <laughs> participation in female sport nationally has largely been about the same. So mm -hmm. the idea that we're growing in participation uh, or the idea that there's, there's been significant gains uh, in, in terms of membership and participation, I'm not sure that actually stands up to social or scientific scrutiny. So I think we've got a long way to go. Well, there's more women's change rooms being there are, built there are a lot at, more at all yes, facilities, whether right. it's cricket, football, right. whatever. So that certainly is progress. Um, Matthew, obviously yeah. the importance of an mm. AFLW team to Port Adelaide. Yeah, and obviously on that front, it's, it's really important. But, you know, to Bronnie and Sam's point, um, you know, someone that has come through sport development, um, you know, I'm reflecting on what you're saying and you're 100% right. It's, um, you know, in some ways it's disappointing that it's, it's just now that we're starting to have this conversation where, um, you know, if we'd been having this conversation 20, 30 years ago, where would we be now? Um, so the, the great thing is that that is happening. And, and I suspect that, that, you know, there's no doubt in South Australia, growth in women's football in particular has, has been growing. And that in itself is then driving that investment into infrastructure and facilities. Um, and, and then I think the other thing, which is something that we do take really seriously at Port Adelaide is that it also is then about providing opportunity mm -hmm. um, because unless you, unless you provide that opportunity, um, then we're not going to move anywhere. So that, for us, that's, yeah, absolutely, that's about players, but it's also about coaches, it's about administrators. Providing more women with those opportunities is a really important um, part of what the journey that we're on. So the roadmap forward, but when can we be at a, a time where we actually don't have to say women's sport needs more? It's actually got what it should have. How many years down the track do you think we are, Roman, with that? Yeah, <laughs> well, I think tough so, question. Yeah, it is. But... A, it is a really tough question, and I think that something has. We have to try and change the status quo of it, because, you know, I think one of the questions you're going to ask me in a minute, Andrew, relates to paying women and the money that they can earn in sport. And there's an argument that says, well, women, women's sport needs to bring more money into the economy. But they have, you know, they're a hundred years behind those traditional big men's sports. You know, men have had men's sports have had a hundred years to build up you know, facilities, sponsorship, corporate dollars, media rights, etc. So if we're waiting for women's sport to be able to contribute at that level, that's, we're going to be waiting generations. So I think something has to change on the status quo um, to, to be able to move that dial quicker. Should women be paid more professionally as athletes? Yeah, I think Is they should that be. Of course, I, I, I think they should be. And if we're waiting for, you know, if we're waiting for the corporate dollar, if we're waiting for the TV ratings for that to happen, I think we're going to be waiting a long time because the reality is that the men's sports are fiercely protective of their media rights deals and the good broadcast times on a Saturday and the better access to pitches and fields and courts. So, you know, unless something changes at that level, we we're going to be waiting generations for this to come. So even in world professional tennis, the, the, the men's and women's winner of major tournaments, the women do not get paid as much prize money as the men. That needs to change. I think it does. Mm. 
Yeah. Your take, Andrew? I think the potential is there. When, when we held the um, the AFLW grand final a couple of years ago, which the, which the Crows won, and there was over 50,000 people who turned up, the demand, we got absolutely caught short. We expected, and this is sort of the role mm. we, us, the AFL, the, the, the clubs, we expected 20, maybe 25,000 would turn up for that mm. game. Yep. But they just kept on coming. And if anybody was there, you would have seen we were madly opening up different parts well, I was of the stadium. There. We Amazing. didn't have enough staff. I was out there directing people, telling them where to go, nicely telling them where to go. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, so the demand is there. I think we just got to really capture mm. that demand uh, to create the flow of funds that, that is needed. As social media, it's a great tool for athletes to communicate directly with fans. But the flip side is the abuse they cop and the impact on mental health. We know this is a big issue. Mm. How do athletes find a balance? Should they stay on social media or should they give it the flick completely? Matthew? Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, as you said, it's a great tool for players and athletes around the world to connect with fans. Um, so it's a, it really brings fans into that one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, but you can't have that um, if that abuse is going back the other way. And, and what you'll see is there will, there are players now that are switching off from social media or are not engaging. Now, what that ultimately will do that will um, that will um, that will reduce the fan experience and the connection that fans have with athletes. So a little bit like the the um you know the race racism conversation that we we're having like we've got to get serious about this and you know for those platforms not to be able to identify people yeah um is wrong um so and you've know, been through this recently with Aaliyah or Aaliyah. yeah absolutely yeah so um you know for people to think that that now we understand in that scenario um there's a person who um thinks that that's okay and they're trying to get a response it's not okay um, and, and it needs to be called out. But also we would say that um, those companies and the authorities need to do more to, to stop that. When you, when you called it out, was that an instant reaction or how much thought had you given that? Yeah, no, it was an instant reaction um, because the reality is uh, that, you know, the players see it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, unless you call it out, then it's not gonna stop. So, Andrew? It's the anonymous nature of social media is what I, I hate it to be honest um I, I see you know the game that Alir Alir played that day was just he was brilliant no one should ever be put through uh anything like that and it it's allowed because it's anonymous and that's what I don't like about social media um if people are going to make a comment then be man or woman enough to stand up and say I'm going to make a comment because as soon as they've got to put their name to it it won't happen but because it's anonymous they feel like they're a, a keyboard warrior and they can go and do it we have i mean some of the some of the feedback that i see coming in to the to the adelaide oval it's just you it's unprintable um and so what do i, I just tell uh and and we have what criticizing well it could be criticizing the oval criticizing staff criticizing players and uh, i tell uh, oh you know and and it's read by young people who are working at the Adelaide Oval and having to filter through what is feedback that needs to be responded to, what is feedback that needs to hit that, you know, the big X and delete it. Um, because it is very important that we respond to appropriate feedback. But some of the stuff that, uh, that I've seen is just, it's just horrifying. And, I, and it affects young people. I've got people that are 21, 22, 23 years old working at the Adelaide Oval, you know, dream job for them. And they're reading some some really unpleasant things. So, what sort of role are you talking about? What sort of criticism oh, do they get? Reception. So, the, who who mm. receives this stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, what, what are the complaints about generally? Oh, it could be about you know the Adelaide Oval or a mob of money grubbing so and sos, which is totally unfair and untrue. I might have. That, uh, but it could be about uh, it could be about players. It could be about play. It could be. It's a whole range of things. It could be about other people in the crowd. You know, I, there was a person next to me in, the, in this seat number and they were a so-and-so, so-and-so. So, um, and what I don't like is that a lot of this is anonymous. So if we get proper feedback about things we do wrong, no problem. Hmm. Improper feedback, I don't like, and it is almost always 
anonymous. And so it's very hard to respond to. Uh, there have been occasions where we've had feedback about all sorts of people riding the oval. I don't think they quite know where it's going. Um, but sometimes I've actually contacted the individual back and said, I am the chief executive. I have seen this. This is inappropriate. We will not deal with you in the future. And invariably, that's it. Bang. You never hear from them again. So um, it's social media has good elements. It's a great way to communicate, great way for players to, to link in with, with, with their fans. And, but it has a really nasty side. And I, I, I agree with Matt that the government, the big organisations, they've got to stamp out anonymous comments. Just not let anybody log on unless you know it is Andrew Daniels and I am writing this. You in discussions about that at all? With the, with the right authorities or? Actually, honestly, at the moment, no, we're not. Okay. But you've actually spurred me on to maybe we should be. Because I know, Paul, mm -hmm. you've gone down that path, haven't mm. you? Tried to... Well, the, the AFL certainly have. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, we would support that. Yeah. Bronwyn, your take on it all? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I love, uh, who, was the, who was the female uh, player that had the post pulled down? It was Taylor. Um, Taylor Harris. Taylor yeah. Harris, mm. you know, and she, they, Channel 7 pulled that picture down, worrying that it was offensive to her. And she said, no way, you know, I'm mm. putting that picture back. It's not about me. I'm the victim in all this. It's about the trolls. Let's yep. call that out. So True. Mm. Um, I think uh, what Andrew and the points Andrew and Matt make are relevant, but let's get on, let's get on to the bigger organisations and try and stop this anonymous mm. posting. Sam, what's your research say on this subject? Um, I haven't done a lot of research per se on this specific issue, but I do have an opinion on it and, and it probably speaks to my, my point here. We, we tend to live in an era right now that we might label the opinion era. And mm. so social media is simply the conduit for that. And I think this isn't a, an issue for sport. This is just a consumer behavior issue in terms of, um, you know, um, let's say person's behavior. Um, I, I think that the, the challenge going forward is not specific to elite level players as an example, um, as, as distinct mm. from the volunteer coach that has a social media group uh, behind their back of parents disgruntled yes. with their behavior yeah. or their, mm. their skills that they're displaying in a volunteer role. This is, this is across all tiers of sport and indeed uh, all tiers of society. And so the, the conversation re reduced to sport um, is probably not useful because it's something that speaks to just broader consumer population behavior. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I think there's, there's potentially, you know, two ways forward and they're not mutually exclusive. So maybe the first way is to look at whether um, the people that are using social media, the, the elite level mm. players, as an example, do they have the, the assets and the psychological resources to navigate their way through a career when this is part of inevitably their day to day mm. life? So some, some training and some support mechanisms, I think, could be useful um, in addition to what is already provided. But I think on the other hand, some more uh, restrictive measures, as has been uh, suggested, could be worth considering. Yeah. And Sam, equipping clubs to deal with it too, because when it is at a community level or a volunteer level, it's the damage is real. It has a, has the ability to reduce volunteers' participation at community level. So equipping clubs and committees to assist members to deal with it is important too. Yeah. And sports people have got it tough enough without having yeah. to be abused <laughs> on social media. Yeah. Yeah. It's appalling behaviour. Um, we see a lot of instances of athletes leaving sport or a club and having issues adjusting to so-called normal life. What are clubs doing to properly prepare their players as much as people, as athletes? Mm. Um, are they doing enough and what needs to change mm. in this space? Matthew? Yeah, it's... Because um, uh, AFL players can get flipped out of the system yeah, within a year, can't they? spend the entire the average life AFL on a career is three, four years mm. in reality. So, um, yeah, there's no doubt it's something that we continually need to get better at. We, uh, we ourselves have two, uh, Justin Westhoff and Paul Stewart, uh, work in welfare in our club. And the conversations from the senior coach down that we're having with players now is not just about performance on field, it's about their life because... Um, you know, um, we know that people perform better no matter what field they're in, if they're feeling good about themselves and they're happy on field, off field. So those conversations are, you know, something I know that Ken takes very, very seriously and the relationships that he has and all the other coaches have with their players are more than just about, more than just about what's happening in football. So it's, um, it's certainly an area that um, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of growth in. And again, I think one of those issues that um, 
uh, the, the impact of COVID with less resources in clubs, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's a real issue that um, all clubs need to be really focused on. And you set them up with, with uni courses and jobs away from just a playing arena at times? Yeah, look, I mean, they have limited time yep. is the reality. Uh, they, have, they do have limited time. Uh, a lot of the guys try and do part-time study. A um, number of the universities um, have, and, and Flinders do this really well, have specialist programs for elite athletes that give them that flexibility. Uh, online learning now is much more prevalent, so it, give the guy, it gives the guys more flexibility to be able to do that. It's one of the big issues in the in certainly in AFLW is with the with the issues we're going to have to, we're going to be getting ready for with the with our female athletes is uh, are those types of things because they're not going to they're not quite yet fully professional. So there's work and there's study and there's internships and mentorships that are going to be part of that package around making sure that the best way you can ensure that your athletes are going to perform the best is prepare them for for life not just for what happens on field andrew um i think that we can do more to help in this space we're not really involved in it at the moment but um i see as, as matt said i see players come through with it and you know yeah. the wbbl players yeah. you know they come through yeah. and then they're gone mm. um a lot of them so i think if we can uh participate more in helping train them, there's a lot of different areas of the adelaide over whether it be from finance marketing to yeah. management there's all sorts of all sorts of different areas and a lot of players um uh, are very interested in sport as a business as well so um I think this is an area that we can actually assist more on. We haven't done it really in the past, um, but I'd be very interested to explore it. Roman? Yeah, I think, um, as Matthew said, the players don't have a lot of time, but most, particularly elite netball players, are studying or they do have part-time jobs still. Mm -hmm. um, and there are also improved conditions with maternity, you know, maternity conditions now for um, mothers coming through elite systems. So we've got, you know, we have had this year quite a few mothers traveling with babies. So setting people up for life after netball is something that everybody is very conscious of, but you know, you can always do more. Yeah, yeah I, I, I echo this, these sentiments. I think um, my, my, my sense is that the, the traditional model has been when athletes, especially in, in a pathway and they move through the, uh, let's say to a professional or an elite level, um, what tends to happen in a traditional model is that there is some attention given to a holistic approach to athlete development. So some interest in family, some interest in career education, so forth. But the primary responsibility is to be an elite athlete. Um, and so that's to be protected because that's, that's your core business, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think there's a conversation where we can coexist with, um, you know, person first, not athlete first, and what that might encourage. Mm -hmm. And I think you've, you've elaborated nicely mm -hmm. of some of the things that Port are doing really well, but it's not mainstream, I think across all tiers of society, certainly in sport, um, that, that tends to sort of be relegated in preference for participation, performance, pathways. And I think that's something that we could we could do a lot better. It's a big issue, isn't it, because the players, obviously, you know, they've got the crowds cheering, they put so much energy into their sport, the adrenaline, it's an adrenaline rush, mm. constantly. Suddenly, you stop playing, the crowd's not cheering, <clears throat> other players take your spot. Mm. So the mental health aspect of a player post-career mm. is tough. It's really yeah. tough. Well, they're, they're, they're very structured environments, mm. very structured. Um, they have no time. It's mm. all, mm. everything is set out for them. So that um, coming out of that environment where all of a sudden it, it's you that's got to be organized and, and create that structure um, it can be a challenge. And, and, and also that takes time, um, you know, you know uh, kids in school now, they, they don't know what they necessarily want to do um, in the future. Well, these guys are a little bit the same. They've, they've come from school into an elite sport pathway. Six or seven years later, they're, they're out the other end and they're, they're like that 17, 18 year old kid going, right, well, what am I going to do now? So the better you can prepare them on the way through for what's, um, what's after, um, the reality is the better they're going to perform when they're, when they're in your organization. And as you said, Sam, that's the core business about performing, but the reality is the, the, uh, the more settled that are, they are, the happier they are in their, in their life, they're going to perform better. And do you, do you see warning signs? I mean, do you look for warning signs in players? I mean, you knew Warren Treadray, the Port Adelaide great. Mm. He was setting himself up on the media before he retired. Patrick Dangerfield is yeah. doing it at Geelong. So you mm. know 
certain players are setting us about. Others mm. are a different space, aren't they? They're just totally mm. focused on their sport and have no idea what they're going to do afterwards. Yeah. Do you see warning signs during their careers? Yeah, I think you do see some warning signs mm. with some players. I mean, not all of them, but there's definitely been a couple of players that I can think of that you've seen the warning signs coming through and some behaviours that are just, you know, not, not, what, not what that player would normally exhibit. The other thing you're seeing, I think, with particularly with men's sport, is they have managers too. So you've got managers now, which you didn't have many years ago, that yeah. are also there to set them up and equip them and make sure their finances are okay. Right. Um, you don't see it as much in women's sport with management, but I think that, that will be something that will improve in the future. And I think that also helps players equip themselves for, for the life. The manager can play a real role in assisting players with that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Not only um, as far as career opportunities, yeah. but also financially, yeah. making sure they don't waste their money. That's right. And they invest it. Which Sam, you, you didn't see all those years ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. you got a take on this? Oh, I'm just thinking of my colleague who's actually just published a book in this area on athlete transitions out of sport or across mm-hmm. across the sporting journey. And I think one of the, the things I've taken from her work is that the, the mental wellbeing uh, risk is really significant when they are they being athletes are forced um, into retirement sometimes through injury sometimes through decisions not of their own and 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 it doesn't matter how you come to a retirement or transition out of sport there is an inevitable process of reconstructing your identity and when you don't have sport and that structure and that environment that you are so familiar with it's 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 acculturated who you are and it's taken away from you that's a significant undertaking for an individual so um, I think there's definitely some some work to be done, not just in terms of the the forms of support that are available, but making sure that they are set up at intervention points prior to inevitably being cut from a list or being moved on, um, you know, as an elite athlete. I think that's a it's a significant challenge, and uh, investment is necessary to get that right. We are getting better on this. Everyone would agree with that. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, um, although you know, I guess I'm I'm coming from a sport that has more resource to be able to provide that support. Um, but um, yeah, I think in, in the AFL setting we are, but at the same time the, the challenge is still there when guys are delisted or the career ends that yeah, they, they, do, um, they do face those challenges. Mm-hmm. How important is the emerging um, discussion or re- regarding concussion in, in sport, both men and women? This year the AFL brought in a, a medical stub, was supposed to be purely for concussions, we haven't seen it really roll out that way. But how important is this discussion in, in protecting the head and all the research going into that moving forward? Yeah, well, certainly from an AFL perspective, it's real. Um, you know, the AFL have changed the rules um, from the, the, the elite level down to, um, you know, certainly you can see that transition over the last 10 years around the protection of the head and tackling techniques and those types of things. So the, there's no doubt that it's it's real and the, the AFL and and football generally as a code is taking it extremely seriously as uh, as we should. Andrew? Oh, I think as a, as a venue, we're just here, we're here to support. Certainly the medical facilities that we have on site now, and it's the benefit of being an elite uh, stadium. Uh, the medical facilities are quite extraordinary, really. Whatever, whatever is needed by whichever sport, cricket, rugby, uh, AFL football is there. I suppose it's, um, what does worry me a little bit is how much that that reflected down to suburban grounds and then mm. uh, you know for, for the other facilities that obviously can't afford what what we've got it is a very serious issue we need to protect players and we need to obviously look after the long-term health of the game as well yeah it has to be taken seriously and and you know as i understand it from what i've read women are slightly more susceptible to concussion than what what men are from what i understand it so it shouldn't be necessarily a barrier to playing the sport, but how we deal with it and how how policy and, and treatment is informed, I think has to be taken very seriously because obviously we, we know that it can lead to long-term mental mm. health issues down the track. So mm. and we have to do all we can to address it. Sam? Yeah, I think um, in, in the main contact sports that come to mind, such as football as an example, uh, I think the AFL, as, 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 as just one example, are doing some really good things to try and manage the concussion risk um, but I think there's more that can be done for sure. I think the most recent review that I've read uh, has indicated that we can achieve a 70% reduction in concussion risk as long as we, um, not in isolation, but in combination, look at the protective, the educational and the governance elements of sport. And so what that looks like at, at a protective level, it's, it's headgear, um, mouth guards, helmets, et cetera. But in isolation, that's not enough. And so the next layer might be around education to make sure that we've got good concussion protocols, we've got quality training, um, good follow-up practices. 
Uh, and then I, I guess sitting underneath that as well, governance. And so this might be rules of the game as an example. And I know that the, and you know, this is, I can hear my dad saying this, like leave the game alone, but um, the reality is- <laughs> We all is, say that all the time. I know, <laughs> I can appreciate that. But um, you know, if we're taking this conversation yeah. seriously, which yes. you know, in the spirit of a fearless yeah. conversation, if we're, if we're dead serious about that, then as a, as a consumer and as a, as a sport fan, we have yeah. to understand that the well-being of the players is absolutely critical. Mm. And I don't yeah. think we should compromise on that. And so yeah. the rules and the governance of the game that work to protect the players help to contribute to that, that overarching, you know, up to 70% risk reduction, which I think is, is really key. We've got a couple more questions to work through, but I just had one come in from, from the public, from Gareth. Um, what lessons have the panellists learned from their involvement in sport that have helped them navigate life more broadly? Start with you, Bronwyn. Oh, thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> the well, lessons you've learned that's made you a better person in life. Yeah, the lessons I've learned, I've been involved with sport for a long time. And to me, what I've learned is that sport really matters. It matters to community. It matters to people. Uh, it brings communities together. You know, I look at my own club. I'm still involved and still play for the Allgate Netball Club. You know, I look at um, a mum we've got out there who's, who once uh, who had a daughter with rheumatoid arthritis. And I remember as, as the president of that club saying, you know, that little girl couldn't play. She couldn't play. She just wanted to come and stand on the side of the court in her dress. And I said to that mum, what do you need from us? You know, as a club, how can we support you? And she said, I just need my daughter to feel normal. I just need her to feel like she's part of a team and this is her tribe. And that, that day to me just told me how important sport is to communities and it, and it really matters. So as a sports administrator now, I get to make sure that we're you know running, our sport is alive, it's robust, our clubs are, are, are welcoming places for the community to be in. Um, I've learned that sport matters to communities. Andrew? It's a really good question. And um, I've learned so much uh, in through sport. One of the things that I also see perhaps slightly differently is what goes behind putting an event on and uh, to you have the amazing players out there on the field on the court doing what they do best but then behind the scenes often unsung yes. is all of the people that helped put that on whether they be volunteers whether they be event staff whether they be security in the kitchen doing all sorts of different things mm. um, and they are also proud of what they do and it makes me incredibly proud to to be to be part of that whole system and what I've seen particularly over the last two years or the 18 months of COVID is how resilient that group is, but also how much when they are not able to do their bit to deliver for their sport, mm. how much they feel like, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not participating. What, what am I doing wrong? What can I do to help bring the sport back? So um, I find that uh, that has made me very proud. It's, it's broadened my outlook in terms of the, the people that I've got to meet, uh, the incredible stories that go behind virtually every one of them has their own, has mm. their own, well, everyone has their own stories. Which is a journalist you find. They've all got their own yeah. great stories to tell. Absolutely, and, it, and it's, it's amazing. And, and people who come and, and, work, and work for us for, for years and years have come up from Amy Stadium, mm. have, have, have been in the cricket system since the days of almost from Don Bradman. You know, it's, <laughs> they are so long serving and they're so passionate about what they do. Just to Andrew's point, people talk a lot about the player player sacrifice, but every time the government has, re has released a new COVID management, you know, seating plan, mm. no one thinks about the this, the ticketing manager who's sitting there till 2 a.m. reseating every member in that stadium. So, Correct, and mm. absolutely. They do an amazing yeah. job yeah. and 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 they don't, but nobody, nobody sees it. No. And they're not there for, rec they don't yeah. want to be out there yeah. in, in, in front. But that's They're trying to make sure that that member and that sports fan has a good experience. And you've really seen people give deep. Correct. And then, then you, get an email, you get an email saying yeah. it's not, not big enough yeah. capacity at <laughs> the ground. <laughs> Correct. And yes. I also get the email saying, yeah. you know, how come I didn't get my ticket? Yeah. Um, or, you know, or something went yeah. wrong because things yeah. do go wrong. That's right. uh, so yeah. uh, it's, it's been an amazing journey. And Matthew, what have you learned from sport that's helped uh, you navigate life more broadly? Yeah, I've been involved in sport my whole life. Sport is... Um, you know, it's about it's always about teamwork and about the way your people work together. Um, and you know, there's just amazing people, whether that's on field or off field, that are, off field or that are generally involved around sports. Never about them. Um, and um, you know, it's you know, as a as a team of people, it doesn't matter what sport you're involved in or what organisation you're involved in. It's um, you know, it, it is always about teamwork and and what you can achieve as a group of people. So. 
um, you know, sport means a lot to a lot of people, and you know, I'm really fortunate as a sports administrator that um, you know that we're custodians and the people that that we serve, our members and our supporters, the joy that it brings them, um, you know, really um, is incredibly rewarding. Sam, yeah, I mean, I'm just reflecting on um, when I used to play sport back in Mount Gambia as a child, and um, used to play for the South Gambia Demons and. You know, you reflect on then and, and now as a you know as a parent with a couple of young kids and I think the lessons that I'm I'm gleaming, you know, constantly. And you're involved with the South Adelaide Football I am, Club too, yeah, the coaching yeah. capacity. Yeah, development yep. coach there as well. And I you know, with these multiple hats and even you know, through my research where I, I fundamentally look at like parent involvement in sport, the, the two things sort of I guess come to the surface. Number one, that relationships matter. It doesn't matter what you're doing as a coach, a volunteer, mm. uh, a participant, relationships matter and and that's that's in any in any achievement domain, schools, you know, workplaces, definitely sport. I think that that rings true, and and I don't always get that right. And it's something that um, you know we, uh, we we constantly use sport as a as a point of reflection because people it brings different people together, mm-hmm. different worldviews, and and navigating and working and growing, um, you know, with different people is 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 a challenge. But I think that's what sport invites. And I guess the second thing is that um, the, there's no boundaries. There's no boundaries to this conversation. You know, we've covered a lot of topics today, but the thing that I'm learning from sport is that people have their own way of coming into this world and it needs to be respected and, and nurtured. And um, there are endless possibilities when you start from that, that point of departure. Mm. This is very topical, given the fact the, uh, the AFL Grand Final most likely won't be held in Melbourne at the MCG this year due to COVID. How important is it that we attract premium sports events to South Australia? Should we go after the Grand Final? And how would we generate a long-term return. Andrew, over to you. Uh, the answer is absolutely <laughs> yes. I mean, my... my, my That's this going hard at the grand final. Go, go hard <laughs> for the grand final. I mean, my, my career in event management and sport goes all the way back to the days of Formula One. And I saw, I was part of the team that delivered that here for, for a number of years. And that was an amazing event. And we all saw what it did for Adelaide back then, bringing an inter, a big international event. Um, and we saw the devastation when that when that left, when we lost it to our friends over in Victoria. The importance of the highest elite level of sport being played here, I think, is incalculable. Seeing Ash Barty win the Adelaide International last year, that was that was incredible. We had the world's best tennis players here in Adelaide. To have the opportunity to then host the AFL Grand Final in what would be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Well, I have to say probably, hopefully a once in a lifetime opportunity. We don't want pandemics again. Um, The Adelaide Oval, we know that we can do it. We know it's the best location for it. We know that we are going, we are up against it with our friends over in Western Australia because they've got the biggest stadium and they've got a capacity that they can go to there and they're in a, a different COVID plan to us. But um, I can assure you that we are doing everything that we can as the venue to put South Australia in the best possible position so that if we don't don't get it, I can look in the mirror and say, well, there's nothing that we could have done differently or that we didn't do that cost us. What sort of crowd could we possibly hope to get in a month's time? I know it's pie in the sky stuff. Look, it, but... it's pie in the... Currently, we're at 15. Yep. We need to be a lot north of that. I, I would love to see a full stadium, and um, but I think that's probably unfortunately unrealistic. Uh, I think if the South Australia's numbers stay good, then significantly more. It would have to be at, uh, at least seventy-five percent. Um, but it's it's out of our hands, and it's it's you know I, I take my hat off to what. Um, the, the, the team at SA Health have done. They've kept the state safe. They've basically kept it open. We have still been able to hold games, have crowds, have events, mm-hmm. even if they're not where we want them to be, at least we've, we've had them. Mm-hmm. And if we hadn't had their guidance over the last 18 months, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, so it's it's fingers crossed, Andrew. We're, we're there pushing for every, every single body that we can to get in there safely and in a way that SA Health approves. I know you're very biased, Matthew, because yep. Port Adelaide uh, is the second seed for the AFL finals, but uh, should we be going hard at the GF? Yeah, look, I mean, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that we've talked a lot about today is the, the community impact and the mental health impact that sport has. But 
probably um, you know sticking up for Andrew here and the stadium is the economic the economic impact that sport has is significant mm. and any investment that goes into securing content at the Adelaide Oval like a grand final whatever money the government put in in order to secure that that money comes back through into grassroots football yep. um, the the money that Adelaide Oval generates that goes into the SNFL and comes back into community clubs if that um, if that game is not there then effectively the government is going to have to or someone's got to fund that anyway so the economic impact at the other end of having AFL football at Adelaide Oval, of having a grand final at Adelaide Oval, um, that economic benefit to the state and to community sport is significant. Absolutely. Roman? Oh, I personally think the AFL grand final should be rotated through states anyway. So, um, you know, I think, you know, if you're sure right playing a grand final, mm. I think you should earn the right to host it. So yeah. um, that's, that's my view. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, but uh, to I guess to echo the mm. point that you've made there um, is that um, any investment in elite level sport, I think, should be matched at the grassroots. I don't think it's a top down conversation or a ground up. I think you need them both if you want sport to thrive in the state. And um, I think the grand final would be a great ticket. But the consequence of that is most likely that we inspire more people to hopefully want to play our game. But we need to get that entry level experience right for kids and families if we want to hold on to them. And so that's a mm. key. I think it's a key medium term sort of ambition that we need to take seriously to couple the success that bringing the grand final to South Australia uh, promises. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's not just about the AFL grand final, it's about bringing diamonds content or it's yep, about correct. bringing, you know, elite soccer, con whatever it is, it's about bringing elite content and into South Australia. And you had the elite Australia. national we had the elite for a week. <laughs> for a week, <laughs> Unfortunately. but it's about being out of, you know, should the government be pitching for that content to come to South Australia? Yes, mm. I think it should yeah, for yeah. our future generations. And that would have been fantastic for netball. It SA would have been amazing. To well, we, we, tournament. You know, we yeah. had the two games here without even promoting it within 24 hours and we had 800 people present, yeah. you know, without any promotion. So I think it had it stayed here, South Australia would have really supported it. Mm. But, very unlucky there. Now, mm. question from Damien. Um, what has Australia sport learned about other countries' bubble sporting solutions and how can we implement them here in Australia? Yeah, um, I know there's been a lot of research going into, you know, the NBA and the NFL and, mm. so, and how some of those sports have, have managed through COVID. And, you know, you look at the EPL at the moment and they're back to full crowds, full stadiums. Mm. And I think we sort of sit here and we're quite jealous of that. I, it's it's difficult to separate the the health and the societal um, you know um, impacts of COVID and where each country is at to, to sport. It, it is intertwined. Uh, I would say that you know the from a um, certainly from an AFL perspective, the fact that we've been able to keep the season going um, across all the jurisdictions is it has been incredibly challenging. The, desert, the AFL deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, but um, yeah, it is interesting to see how um, sports around the world have, have managed it in different ways. I think there's been a lot of learnings, Andrew, um, and I, I, uh, we're in the fortunate position of seeing many different sports and how they've, how they've responded, uh, whether it be international cricket, whether it be AFL football and so forth. Um, I think now that Australia is, is doing it extremely well, the Australian uh, sports are doing it extremely well, and I. I think that the that gives health the confidence to still have mm. cricket matches, still have AFL matches, because they understand that um, the the controls that are put over the players and the the players and the teams are professional, and therefore, hopefully, they do what they're told and they follow the rules. I'm sure that's always the case, isn't it, Matt? Always, yeah, always. Right. Mm. Check the. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think that. Um, the whole world has has learned a lot I, I think that a lot of this COVID protocol issues that we face they're going to be with us for a number of years now and i think that what south australia what south, what australia has developed the afl um the sterile corridor that allows teams to come in play a game at the adelaide oval fly out uh they're now tried and tested uh, and i think and obviously other countries are also looking at what we do and how they can do things better as well and we could go forever this has been a very interesting hour's conversation. I really thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time with questions still up our sleeves. So thank you for being a part of Fearless Conversations. Um, this was episode one of 13 over the next 13 weeks. So please stay tuned. <laughs>